This game has been in early access for three years, but it's only been on my radar for three days. So we're playing a game called Chrono Arc. It is surprisingly good. We're going to talk about this game, introduce the game to you, and play just a tiny bit of the game as well. It was recommended to me by Steam, so thank you for having a good algorithm. It had tags of deck building, of strategy, of action RPG, I believe, like role-playing game. Uh, it is something akin to Slay the Spire in the way that any time you build a deck of cards, it's kind of like Slay the Spire. But this is maybe, maybe start with Slay the Spire, but instead of having only one character, you have like four characters and you have all of their cards in your deck at the same time. You can unlock synergies. You can have a tank, a DPS, and a healer. You can have two DPS people, things along those lines. One of the things that really sets this game apart is not only the artwork, which is really good, um, it has a storyline to it, which is surprisingly uh, surprisingly compelling. I don't know the entire storyline, but I've unlocked a little bit of the storyline. I know a little bit of what's going on, but one of the things that really made my interest in Slay the Spire drop off over time is it, it was a good game. It was, it was like, it was an excellent game. There's a reason that everyone talks about Slay the Spire, but there wasn't really a reason for doing anything. It was just like, here's a game, it's good. Here's your deck, it's fun, but there's no reason for it. So the fact that you have like these, these JRPG elements of building relationships with your teammates, of unlocking outfits if you want to, or learning the lore as you play, or figuring out who this little girl is and why these other people might know what's going on, but some people don't know what's going on, and one of them definitely knows what's going on. The storyline to the game has been surprisingly compelling so far. So we're going to jump in and I'm gonna show you exactly what's going on. I'm gonna ditch this run because, because this is a roguelike with elements of meta progression. And I don't wanna just start where I dropped off six hours ago. It's boring. What's the workshop? We'll talk about the workshop. So this is a roguelike, very similar to Slate Spire. You uh, you start out in town here. You have lots of little uh, NPCs that you can chat to as well. But let's uh, let's walk out of here. I guess I can show you real quick. But if you're if you're interested in the lore, which you ought to be because it's pretty good, uh, all of your memories, all of your lore, arc project, what the fuck, all that stuff is uh is over here in case you'd like to delve into it and see exactly what's going on. Bloop. But let's let's walk into town and show you what's going on here. So normally, if you have four characters in your deck, if you draw a card for one character or you draw a card for another character, it's like, well, I wish I only had cards for one character so that I can invest in that one character and have that one character pop off as much as possible. I've been surprised while playing this game that it feels coherent to have four different party members in your group at the same time and have their four different cards and still feel like you have a coherent party where the people are working together. I will say one of the things that really stands out for me about this game and makes me want to recommend it to people in Twitch chat or people to you on YouTube is the tutorial was good. And I get fucking excited when I play a video game that has a good tutorial to it. I don't mind sitting down for five or 10 minutes at the beginning of a game and just being like, okay, that's this button, that's this button, that's this button. Some people will hate that. Some people hate the instruction manual and they just want to jump in and start punching stuff. Do it. I don't know, but maybe you won't like it. So that has been my experience. I love the tutorial and they did a very good job of explaining to me what's going on. So this game also rewards reading, which I know we're all gamers. You might hate that, but if you're okay with reading, if you're okay with like hovering over this icon and seeing what it is, this is a translated game from Korea or something. It's not a native English game, but the translation's quite good. I, if you hadn't told me that the game came from a different language, I wouldn't have figured that out until much later. So there are, uh, this is, this is a translated game. There are lots of things that you can hover your mouse over and read about. Uh, let's, let's take a little chibi person. Let's go, let's go talk to someone real quick. All the communication with NPCs looks something like this. You can kind of click through it. You can find out, here's Miss Chain. Yeah, she's great. We like her. We can go to the vending machine and we can purchase things that allow us to build relationships with our team members. So that's cool. We have four people in our team, but we have like a fifth. 
So there's like a hidden fifth like meta person. And the hidden fifth meta person is Lucy. So Lucy, she doesn't deal damage, but she'll have cards as we as we build our deck. And let's show you what that looks like real quick. We're going to grab a DPS person and a tank person, just like a real normal setup. I'm going to grab a uh, Hanzo here. Sorry, Johan. I'm going to grab a uh, Johan here. We'll put him in our team on the bottom right corner. And then I'm going to grab the, uh, the tanky boy, Ironheart. So let's do this. We go back to our little chibi view. And this is stage one. So much like in Slay the Spire, you have these branching paths that kind of uh, tie the room together. You progress through them. You'll see that on the top right corner of my screen, I've got these little hex grid. And as I walk around with the most important mechanic of the game, um, jumping, which literally has no impact on the game, uh, you'll see that there are some things that show up on the minimap and I can interact with them. And in fact, I can even teleport between them if I want to save time and move just a little bit faster. So very similar to Slay the Spire, you also have some items up here. I can teach skills to my party. I can use a key to unlock stuff as I walk around. I've got bread to heal people and I've got Lucy's necklace that can res someone if they faint. On my uh, on my menu here, I'm gonna hide my video for just a moment so you can see what's going on. We have um, we have upgrades with our soul stones here. There's three currencies that you will see tick up as you progress through the game. One is gold, which is only within this one singular run, and you use it to buy things like keys from the stores you find in your one singular run. The next one up here is soul stone. Soul stones are used to upgrade things to either increase your maximum mana, add more card draw to your deck. If you're, if you're a Magic the Gathering player, you could add more Ponders and Preordain to your deck like this. They might cost one, they might cost zero. You can see your different characters, you have some fixed abilities, and the game does a really good job in the tutorial of teaching you what these fixed abilities are, what these passes mean, and how these things interact. These stats seem relevant to me, but I, after playing for about 20 hours at this point, I have not delved into these stats. I think you can you can make it pretty far into the game, I'd expect, by just ignoring these things. What this does tell you though, if you have something that says like 20% increased healing power or plus one healing power, the plus one is pretty good because your healing power is only seven. The numbers are all numerically quite low, which makes it easy to wrap your mind around, which I like. I think it's a great feature. So these are our characters, and here's our Lucy. Let's uh, let's click on this. Let's do just we'll we'll do like one little uh, one little thing like this, one little shrine, and then we'll do one piece of content as well. Okay. So all allies take damage. Take damage. Um, uh, mm, you know what? Let's let's take some damage. Bonk me. Do it. All allies take six damage. Obtain a key. While well, we only have one key right now, sure. Let's go grab a key. Six damage. That's a quarter of my health. Holy shit. All right. Let's keep walking around. Ooh. Let's walk in here. Let's go use the key. What do we have here? A token of valor? It increases attack power? Yeah. So let's go ahead and put that on Johan here. So he's my attacker. Ironheart's going to be my defense. I'm going to give him some extra, extra power here. I like that. Let's keep walking. We're going to go find some comment or some content. Some, uh, some monsters to punch. We'll teleport back here real quick just to save some time. Let's see. Oh, I'm, I'm taking a look up here and I see that there's some bad guys. So this means that the boss is over here. So I don't want to fight the boss yet. Let's go down here and show you what some sample content, what some, uh, some enemies look like. So again, like I said earlier, this game really rewards you for reading, for <laughs> taking a look at the icons on the screen and knowing um, what they do. So this little hedgehog here, Pop your mouse over it. It says turn infinite. It's like this never goes away. It's not, it doesn't just disappear after one turn. Uh, cannot be disabled. Armor 50%. The hedgehog on top takes the next hit, absorbing incoming damage. This is a hedgehog snowman. There's three little hedgehogs. <laughs> you have to hit him at least three times in order to defeat this enemy. Adorable. The, uh, the numbers on the bottom here. Again, the tutorial does such a good job explaining this. And I love games that have good tutorials in them. So this number down here says that any time that we take an action, it will count down to zero. When it hits zero, he'll punch you. Some skills will have blue background and some skills will have a purple background like this. Blue background is swift. Um, I, I call this quick. I don't know what, what game did I play in the past that has the word quick. I think that might have been like a Legends of Runeterra thing. So this, 
I can use this and it costs one mana, which corresponds to my mana up on the top left here. It'll cost me one mana, but this four won't go down. On the other hand, if I use one of these basic attacks that has a purple background where it does not say the word swift, it will cause his attack timer to go down or his action count. So let's punch him like this real quick. We're going to deal nine damage. Probably going to kill the little guy on top like this. Cool. So there's only two snowmen left. His action count's still four. Let's hit him with a nice basic attack right here. Let's see. This is going to be... Uh, it cost me one mana, so my mana will go down to one after this. And his action count is going to go down to three. Cool. And there's only one little little snowman hedgehog left. So let's go ahead and shoot him. Lawless victory. So after that, we find some items. We find some gold. We find some soul stones. And our soul stones, like I said before, are one of the ways we'll level up our characters while we are um, while we're playing the game. So we have some up arrows here telling us that we have some actions we can take. We can increase our maximum mana. We can add ponder and preordain to our deck. We can add more cantrips, more card draw. We can level up this guy. And once you level them up, they'll gain access to their passives. So let's take our DPS guy, <coughs> level him up to deal some more damage. And I'm going to learn some skills here. There's actually a reason to build a relationship and to give gifts to people and to learn the lore of the game. And that is, as you... Um, as you build a relationship, you will have more options to pick from. So instead of have, only having three options, I've built up my relationship with Johan, and I've learned his lore, and I've heard his backstory. So now instead of only three options, now I get five options here. So let's go ahead and click on one of these. I can, I can see all my gifts here, and once I complete a, a stage, There'll be a campfire scene and I can sit around the campfire and I can give him a shonen manga and maybe I can build up my relationship with him a little bit more if he likes shonen manga. This might be written somewhere, whether this person likes this gift or this person likes milk or maybe that person likes coffee or this person likes guns. I've been doing a trial and error and it seems fine. It's not punishing. So that's, that's been my experience so far. I found it fun, cute, and not annoying, which is nice. You can always fast forward through it all if you want to. So we'll click on one more thing down here. I'll grab this. Got a little wooden box. And you know what? Let's let's go see if we can kill the boss real quick. I'm going to go immediately to the boss and show you what boss number one looks like. And then we'll call that good. So this is what? Cerberus? Yeah. 71 health. And after one action, he's going to take a, He's going to punch me. So I'm going to use my close range shots, which is swift. So it won't cause this to go down. Punch this guy. I've got a basic protect, which will add some shield to one of my characters. I'm going to protect my DPS person. Again, this is blue. It's swift, so it's not going to cause this action to happen. And then let's see. Maybe we just punch him one more time, huh? Let's do this. And then he's going to hit me after I do this. Rude. You'll see that my health bar changed. Again, tutorial, it's awesome, but I might as well talk about it. We have red health, green health, and red health. So if you hover over this, God, I love games that explain things to you. The green bar indicates a healing gauge and that can restore health to you. When you're restoring the green health, you're restoring a maximum effect. If you're trying to restore that black health, you're gonna be restoring a, like a greatly diminished effect. You can, uh, you can restore this health, but it's much harder to restore the black health than it is to restore the green health. At the end of any given combat, all of the green health becomes restored. So the game encourages you to like finish combats quickly and not stretch them out ad nauseum. One of the other components that feeds into that is this thing up here, the six. So we're on turn one. And this is uh, this has six. Starting from this turn, six, all allies will lose speed. They cannot overheal and they take pain damage from fog and the pain damage from fog increases gradually over time. So there is a soft enrage on um, on every single fight in the game. I've only encountered this like once on an end game boss, an end game on a boss. And my characters were like pretty bad and ended up, ended up dying. But there are other mechanics. There's relics, there's meta items, there's equipment that interact with the fog mechanic. So it's not just there to punish you, but it is something that you ought to know about. So let's punch this guy one more time. And then I guess I can heal up. There, I healed up all my green health and we'll ship the turn back to this guy. He yelled at me, brutal dude. I have a burning arrow, what's this do? It applies, it has a 110% chance of applying burn. 
cool. So if the enemy has a chance to like avoid burn, this will probably still hit because it has more than 100% chance to apply it. So let's uh, let's punch him with our basic arrow. We'll punch him with a burning arrow. And maybe we'll punch him one more time. Oh no! It's fine. Maybe if I can end the fight before this green health goes away, then I should be able to uh, restore all of this. Let's go ahead and do that. I've got one mana left. Just enough to do a basic attack. Cool. Totally decimated the level one boss, baby. Love to see it. So we got some loot. And like I said before, we always have this this little um, this little campfire. And the campfire allows you to recruit the next person to your fart party. And as you progress, you'll end up having four people in your party at any given run. So let's go ahead and recruit. Uh, how about how about Sizz? We'll grab Sizz to our party here. I don't really know what they're doing. But we can use a camping item. We can heal ourselves up. We can use a token of friendship in case we want to learn more about someone's backstory. And uh, get them to the point where we get five options instead of just getting three options. And that's explained to you up here. So anyways, that is a brief overview of the game that we've been playing. It seems like there is a bit of a community for this game as well. Um, I, I think there's a Reddit for it. I don't, there's probably a Discord somewhere as well. But the Twitch community does not seem to be thriving. So I'm just going to keep streaming this game because I'm having fun with it. But again, it came out in early access three years ago. And then came out with 1.0 just a couple of days ago. I've been enjoying it. I'm surprised at how much the artwork um, and the, the storyline of the game make me feel compelled to keep playing. And I would happily recommend it to other people as well. If you've got other roguelike games or deck builders or RPG things that look like this... I do like a good deck builder, and I do like things that remind me of basically cube drafting, if you know what that is, from Magic the Gathering, because that's been a guilty pleasure of mine for 15 years. It's a good time. Anyways, this is great. Try it out. It's on Steam. I'll see you next time.